Welcome to part 12 of the lecture series here on the Second World War. Now we're going to talk about the creation of the atomic bomb. On December 21st, 1938, something pretty incredible happened. Uh, two German scientists, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann, had successfully proven something that up to this point had only been a mathematical theory uh, could become a reality. They split an atom. Right? They, in a control environment, managed to split uranium-235 into two smaller atoms. And as mathematically predicted, it released a lot of energy, including neutrons, that could theoretically then create an uncontrolled chain reaction, where the neutrons split other atoms, and then that keeps on going. And if you do that really, really, really fast, you get a really, really, really big explosion. Now, this is going to terrify the scientific community. Why? Well, because... Otto Hahn is living in Nazi Germany. Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann uh, are living under Nazi rule, and Otto Hahn will become the leader of the Nazi atomic bomb project, right? Right away, everybody knows that you can make a weapon out of this. It's so terrifying, in fact, that scientists are going to try and get President Roosevelt to take some action, right? A uh, scientist named Leos Lazard is going to get into a car driven by another scientist, a Hungarian named uh, Edward Teller. The reason why Edward Teller was brought that day, as he himself put it, well, Slazar didn't know how to drive a car, right? And so for that day, he wasn't a nuclear physicist, he was a chauffeur. They drove out on August 2nd, 1939, to Albert Einstein's house with a letter for Einstein to sign. Slazar had composed this letter, but Slazar wasn't very well known. In this letter, it says President Roosevelt is very important. I'm going to paraphrase this to that uh, the Germans are going to develop a bomb and they can't get it first. We have to have a developmental program ourselves. Signed, Albert Einstein. That gives it some clout, gives it some weight. Einstein will sign the letter and the uh, Americans, along with the British, will begin developing a bomb. The British had already been uh, developing the science through a thing called the MAUD Committee, M A U D. Right. What they're going to end up doing is they're going to send all of the stuff that they all the research they've done, all the paperwork and their best physicist, including a very uh, talented spy named Klaus Fuchs. And uh, they are going to join the project in the United States, who has more resources to get it done. And you start to see this development ex uh, uh, explode. Excuse the pun. Um, for example, multiple sites are going to be used. It called the Manhattan Project because the planning phase was done in an office in Manhattan uh, in New York City. OK, uh, but for example, Oak Ridge, Tennessee is going to be utilized to create a gaseous diffusion plant called the K-25 plant to diffuse and get weapons grade uranium separated from non weapons grade uranium 238 doesn't work very well in a weapon 235 does you got to separate uranium from uranium. Hanford, Washington is going to develop the first plutonium plant plutonium does not happen in the uh, in nature you actually have to do it by causing um, uranium to fusion and become neptunium, which is unstable and transmutates up to plutonium. I know that's a little bit complicated, right? And then finally, Robert Oppenheimer, who was the head of the scientific aspects of this project, and General Leslie Groves, who was the head of the military aspects of this project, will settle on creating a uh, research facility in a former Boy Scout camp up in New Mexico called Los Alamos. This is where the bomb itself will be constructed. All right. So you have projects going on everywhere. On December 2nd, 1942, Enrico Fermi in Chicago is going to create the first nuclear reactor. It's going to be called CP1, Carbon Pile 1. Right. This nuclear reactor is going to be the first sustained controlled nuclear chain reaction. It's going to, the thing looks like a Borg cube. It's a big graphite cube that has rods of uranium in it and rods of graphite. When you pull the rods of graphite out, the neutrons begin bombarding each other and you start having atomic fission. That's when the atoms split. It's called fission. All right? And if you want to stop it, you slide the graphite rods back in, which absorb the neutrons. Okay? Now, this was built underneath the uh, football stadium at the University of Chicago, Stags Field, in a racquetball court. Thank God it didn't blow up when they pulled the first graphic rod out, or Chicago might look very different today, right? In Los Alamos, they're going to develop the design of the bomb itself. 
There's two designs that come out of this. <clears throat> the first one is a gun gauge style. This is a round ball of near critical mass, in other words, nearly to the point of self-sustaining chain reaction, uranium, weapons grade uranium. And what you do is you take another slug of uranium with explosives behind it and you shoot it into the other ball. That causes it to reach critical mass and then kaboom. This design, they're pretty certain it's going to work. It's a pretty simple design, and uranium-235 will very readily react to this. Matter of fact, they're so sure that this design is going to work, they're not going to test this weapon design until they drop it on Hiroshima. The other design for plutonium is different. You can't use the gun gauge style for, uh, uh, for plutonium because you'll just blow the plutonium apart. You effectively create a dirty bomb. Instead, what you got to do is you got to take a ball of plutonium and just squeeze it smaller. It's almost critical mass. Squeeze it smaller. It will be critical mass. How do you do it? You pack explosives around it, all of them going off at the same time with the force going inward to squeeze the ball really, really, really hard. That they're not so sure is going to work. That one they have to test. And so they do. Uh, they build a prototype, right? They assemble it on the Alamogordo bombing and gunnery range at a place called Hornada de Muerto, right? The uh, Day of the Dead, set of lava fields in the middle of this gunnery range. And on July 16th, 1945, they test this plutonium device. The site today is called the Trinity site. It works, all right? The flash is so bright from this first atomic explosion that it actually is far away, 90 miles away in Albuquerque, the pre-morning sky suddenly turned bright blue as if it was the middle of the day, and then plunged back into darkness. Now imagine if you were a citizen in Albuquerque at that time, you're walking the dog in the early morning hours, you have no clue about this project, it's a secret project, and all of a sudden it's like, daytime? Not daytime. I probably had to scare the hell out of you, right? Now, these bombs that are going to be used in Japan are going to be, first you're going to have the uranium bomb. They're going to call that Thin Man because of its long, thin design. It's going to be dropped on Hiroshima on August 6th, 1945, killing about 70,000 people immediately, probably another 70,000. You're never going to get exact numbers on this. 70,000 will die from radiation poisoning uh, within about five years of the blast, right? The second bomb that will be dropped on August 9th is a plutonium bomb that, of course, they'll call Fat Boy. It's big and round. Right, that they'll drop on August 9th, 1945, on the city of Nagasaki. Again, killing around 70,000 people immediately. And again, untold how many die afterwards. This, of course, brings up an important question, right? What made them decide to use the bomb, right? Why did they use it in the first place? I mean, today, when we look at it from the uh, historical hindsight, you know, we have 2020 vision uh, looking backwards, um, you know, we can see a lot of arguments against ever using the bomb. And don't think that some of those arguments didn't exist back then too, right? But uh, there are five really fundamental things that were at play here that led to, this, to the decision to drop the bomb. Number one, uh, you needed to try and end the war as soon as possible. And it was believed if you had this weapon of just tremendous destruction, can destroy an entire city with just one plane and one bomb, that that might finally compel Japan, who seemed to be absolutely refusing to quit, despite the fact that they were on their heels, to finally give it up. Remember, Okinawa, Tarawa, all these different examples, right? The estimates of invading Honshu, right, or Kyushu, which was the first target main island, were just you know incredible. They figured at least 32,000 American dead, and it, maybe even as many a million Japanese civilians killed. Right? There's all these different things that were in play. Okay, uh, so you know you need to end the war as quick as possible. How do you look at a gold star mom in the face and say, oh well, we could have ended this war 12 months earlier if we just dropped this bomb, right? Second, uh, you need to justify the expense of the bomb. I know that seems kind of callous, but it's true. Right? This is the second most expensive project of the war. The most expensive project was the B-29 bomber, which was used to drop it. So technically, you could say that's part of the cost. It is the most expensive project in the war in that case, right? How do you justify spending all those resources and money, and, and, money, and then you create a weapon that you just decide you're never going to use? Uh, third, and Truman, who's president by the time of the dropping the bomb, because FDR had died uh, in April of 1945, um, Truman was hoping to use this bomb as a means to gain 
diplomatic uh, uh, advantage over the Soviets. Matter of fact, when the bomb was tested at Trinity, he was in Potsdam, Germany, uh, talking with Stalin and uh, Clement Attlee and Clerk Churchill was being replaced at that time, right? And he told Stalin about this, you know, we have this great new weapon of incredible destructive power, right? And Stalin gave him a, a response like, oh yeah, really, that's cool, right? And uh, and Churchill, or excuse me, Truman will say, says, I don't think he understands the scope of this weapon. Yeah, Stalin did, he knew about it because of his spies, right? Fourth, uh, there's no incentive not to use the weapon. You have the weapon, why not use it? Like I said, they know about radiation, but they also know the radiation isn't there permanently. Hiroshima is not still a radioactive wasteland, right? There's no big elephant's foot like what you have in Chernobyl today, right? That's not what these bombs do. They blow up and they disperse, and everybody gets a piece of it, unfortunately. And then finally, fifth, just, you know, simple vengeance, right? A desire for de a vengeance uh, for... Uh, the attack on Pearl Harbor, and that will play a heavy role. Now, the atomic bomb will have some influence on ending the war. There's a couple things involved here, right? Uh, and, and sometimes we can downplay the atomic bomb's role in this because it's just a piece of the whole. But Emperor Hirohito had already kind of wanted to get out of the war by uh, early to mid-1945 as it was, right? He was seeing that it was a lost cause. He was seeing the amount of car carnage. And so he had already kind of hinted that he wanted the, uh, at least the anti-war aspect of the Diet to begin putting feelers out to Russia to see if he can create some kind of negotiated peace. They wanted a negotiated peace because of that unconditional surrender thing that uh, Roosevelt had set up at the Casablanca conference, right? An unconditional surrender was almost impossible for Japan to swallow because what that meant was anything was open, including putting the emperor himself up on war criminal charges. Now, when you consider in Japanese society, the emperor is seen as a living god on earth, a direct descendant of the goddess Amaterasu, that is too far, right? Um, the atomic bomb, the first atomic bomb in Hiroshima is going to create a sense of urgency to try and get Russia talking to him. Russia's not answering the calls. Why? Well, because on August 8th, 1945, Russia will declare war on Japan and begin invading China. That's why they're ignoring him, right? When the atomic bomb is dropped on August 9th, you already have Russia at war, the combination of Russia at war, no more avenues for negotiated settlements, and now this atomic bomb that's destroying entire cities, uh, Hiro, uh, Hirohito's issues what is known as the, the Go Sedan, right? He'll state, I have no expectation for victory after considering our material power compared to the enemy in various situations in and out of the country. I should bear the unbearable from the broader perspective. So I decide this way in order to save the people from disaster and bring about happiness to mankind around the world. This is broadcast on August 14, 1945. For many Japanese people, it's the first time they've ever heard the emperor's voice, right? On September 2nd, 1945, on the U.S. battleship USS Missouri, the terms for surrender are signed and Japan surrenders to the United States unconditionally, ending the Second World War. 